Hi, I'm Jessie. I'm a cannabis nurse and the founder of Marijuana Mommy, and you're watching Patients Are the Proof, where we talk about the real benefits of cannabis. And today we are talking about psychedelics. I am here speaking with Shelby Hartman and Madison Margolin, co-founders of Double Blind. Double Blind is a biannual print magazine and media company covering timely untold stories about the expansion of psychedelics around the globe. Hi, thanks for having us. Hey guys, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. So gosh, you, uh, you are both very accomplished writers, journalists and um, reporters, right? So how, how did you end up starting a magazine about psychedelics? Where, where did this all start? It all started on Shelby's meditation pillow. <laughs> Shelby. <laughs> yeah, I, I was meditating and the idea just came to me. My career had sort of set the precedent for it. I had already been reporting on cannabis and psychedelics for quite some time for LA Weekly and Vice, Rolling Stone, and a number of other publications. Um, and yeah, the idea came to me that it was time for a media company that's solely devoted to covering psychedelics as well as everything they intersect with. So wellness, mental health, environmental justice, how do we become more conscientious citizens as we begin to heal ourselves? And Madison, 100%, was always going to be the person to do it with me. So I'm, I'm really glad That's that it's worked out that way. And, and it is. It's growing so much. And I imagine I'm on the East Coast and you guys are on the West Coast. So I know you're, you guys are decades ahead of us in everything, <laughs> including psychedelics. So it's, it's becoming much more um, of a... A trending topic over there than over here, right? How, what's the what's the reception like to your magazine? It's yeah, it's been it's been great. I mean, both on both sides of the country, actually, our biggest markets are California and New York. Um, and you know, on the East Coast, you actually have a lot of federal research that's happening at research institutions like Johns Hopkins or NYU. Um, MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is headquartered in Santa Cruz, actually has research centers all over the country um, in the world, really. So the movement itself is everywhere, but you know, you could look to uh, California, Oregon, um, Colorado as centers of kind of more grassroots policy, um, uh, policy reform. So really in all, you know, spanning the, the science to the grassroots, people have been really receptive in multiple different places, whether it's curiosity around psychedelics or in engagement in the actual like uh, activism that's happening or, you know, hearing something about, the, about uh, research in the news and then wanting to come to us and get a little bit more of a deep dive about it. I love that. And there is so much research. Can you guys speak a little bit about it? Like, I don't know much about psychedelics at all. What I know they're used, you know, they're being looked at more and more for anxiety and a variety of, of mental health issues. What else are you guys seeing them being used for? Psychedelics are being investigated for so many different mental health conditions. We could never possibly cover all the research in one interview. I will say that the first kind of legitimate study that spurred what we're referring to as the psychedelic renaissance, which is this whole new wave of interest in psychedelics since the 1960s, began in the mid-2000s at Johns Hopkins University. They investigated psilocybin, which is the psychoactive ingredient in mushrooms for end-of-life distress, meaning anxiety and depression caused by a terminal illness, um, largely in patients with cancer. Since then, we've seen studies looking at psilocybin for nicotine addiction, for eating disorders. Um, I spoke to someone at NYU who said they're interested in looking at psilocybin for criminal recidivism. So actually, mm. yeah, wow, exactly. Fascinating. So there's so many different applications. MDMA uh, has sort of been the leader in the psychedelic movement as the substance that is paving the way for psychedelic medicine. MDMA, which sometimes people refer to it as ecstasy, that's not quite accurate, but MDMA is 
slated to be legal for post-traumatic stress disorder really? in 2021. There's yeah. been millions and millions of dollars of research looking at the efficacy of MDMA for PTSD in the veteran community specifically, but it also holds so much potential for PTSD in women who have been sexually assaulted, people of color enduring racial trauma. Like it's, yeah, I mean, it's, there's so much. That's amazing. And you know, PTSD is so tough so difficult because there aren't any treatments, you know, they're very, very limited to treating the symptoms and, you know, cannabis has been a big help, you know, where people can access it, but that's amazing. Um, I didn't even, I wasn't even familiar with that, that they're uh, looking to actually legalize it through the FDA, huh? Yeah, absolutely. They are currently in phase three, which is the last stage before a medicine makes it to market. They received breakthrough therapy status by the FDA, which put them on the fast track to getting approved because it is showing so much promise in an area where the Western medical community is desperately in need of novel treatments. So absolutely, I think one of the things that's most exciting about psychedelics, as well as cannabis, and I know I'm preaching to the choir here, <laughs> is that it's showing promise for a lot of conditions that the Western medical community just hasn't figured out. Absolutely. That's amazing. So how about the laws? Um, so I've read, what is it? Oregon is looking to legalize psilocybin, right? And Denver has, right? Is that, is that correct? Denver already decriminalized. Denver already has. Yeah, already and has. Oakland passed a, an initiative that is, essentially it's sort of like decriminalization where it just like places it on the lowest priority. Um, Chicago's uh, a committee within city council just passed it unanimously. So now city council has to vote on it. And California mm -hmm. has a statewide initiative that we're trying to get on the ballot. That's amazing. Before and I clarify though, that the decriminal decriminalization is not legalization. Obviously you understand this, but a lot of consumers don't. Decriminalization mm -hmm. sort of paves the pathway for legalization, but all it means is you can no longer get arrested. Um, basically, and that it's a low priority for law enforcement. Additionally, um, the initiatives in Denver, it was not the city of Denver, it was the county of Denver. So a lot of people mm. don't realize that. And realize that. it's not decriminalizing all plant medicines and psychedelics. It's just decriminalizing psilocybin, which is the psychoactive ingredient in psychedelic mushrooms. Whereas the Oakland initiative actually made um, all psychedelic plant medicines mm. and the cacti a low uh, priority for law enforcement. So that includes like ayahuasca, peyote, San Pedro. Yeah, there are. I mean, that's a good point. There's a huge variety and they all kind of create a different experience, right? And different side effects. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, just these, the, like all these different plants have been in ceremonial use for millennia, I guess. You know, I, <laughs> and so whether they're, you know, the idea is that people now can cultivate them or use them sacramentally or recreationally or whatever without, you know, having to worry too much about prohibition kind of getting it in the is. Way. It's lost medicine, right? Lost medicine and lost art. I mean, that has died with, you know, so many people. It is indigenous, has been used in indigenous communities for, for forever. Mm -hmm. So that's, it's really, it's remarkable to see it come back. What do you guys think about that? I've been, I've been, you know, browsing the different retreats that are out there. It seems like in Netherlands, they do a lot of like psychedelic retreats. Is it legal over there? There are a lot of retreat centers. The Netherlands definitely has a booming psilocybin retreat center scene. And I just, I couldn't tell you like- If it's legal or not. <laughs> but, I, but there's one retreat center called Synthesis, which a lot of people go to. And I know that they are slated to open the first legal psilocybin clinic in the next like few years. Um, there's also um, a retreat center in Jamaica that a lot of people go to. I've heard of that one too, yes. Meditations. And then there's a retreat center, um, a number of retreat centers in Mexico. Um, one of them is called Buena Vida. Um, there's another one called Soul Medicine. So yes, I've seen those too. Yeah. And then that's just psilocybin. There's also legal Ibogaine clinics. Ah, um, that's in interesting. Mexico, yeah. As well as in New Zealand, and I couldn't tell you where else. There's a few countries I know where um, ibogaine clinics are legal. Now, and ibogaine there, that's that's a little controversial, right? Does is there so psilocybin is is one of the safest substances. It's actually been declared safer than cannabis by many by many researchers. Um, but ibogaine. 
that has had some like some fatalities associated with it, right? Yeah, a really small number of small fatalities. Spot, yeah. We're actually doing a story on this in the second issue of of Double Blind. Can't and read it. I want to say out of more than 4,000 estimated people who have done, who had done Ibogaine at the time of the study that I read, like maybe around 15, there had been around 15 fatalities. And most of those, according to Ken Alper, who's kind of the definitive Ibogaine expert at NYU, were totally preventable and a result of just sort of careless protocols, mm -hmm. um, which is scary, right? Because yeah. Um, the problem with these retreat centers is that, uh, some of them are really great and some of them are not really great. And we have this situation now where like in the Amazon, for example, there's retreat centers that totally, um, totally review the mental health history and the medications that a person is on before booking their reservation. And then there's other retreat centers where it's, it's not even a center. It's just like a rogue shaman and who knows if they're even giving you ayahuasca. Right, right. So it is incredibly so important that people do their research to figure out that they're going somewhere legitimate. Um, and also I would say that what's going on with retreat centers abroad is a case for ending prohibition because okay. if we end prohibition, then we are going to be able to have clinics here that are regulated in the United States and none of this will be a concern. That's a great point. I mean, why should people have to, to go out of the country to get treatment for, and you know, I think it's good to point out that Ibogaine is often used for, to treat addiction, right? Are there other uses for it? Does it treat? Um, I mean, it's known really as a treatment for, um, opiate addiction and also has been shown um, to be good for Parkinson's. Oh, really? And what exactly is Ibogaine? So it is the active alkaloid in the iboga plant. So the iboga is um, native to Western Africa and it's um, part of the uh, traditional use by the Bwiti tribe. I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, and so Ibogaine is like an alkaloid within that and yeah, so basically it produces a trip that's like almost more than a day long, depending on kind of right. the patient and the dosage. And you have to go like, you know, like we discussed, like a, a thorough health screening to make sure that the, the patient is Because there are to, risks. Yeah. yeah. It is more, it's much more risky than psilocybin. But yeah. I, people, people swear by it. I mean, a lot of people have had remarkable results from Ibogaine treatment in other countries. It's in the second issue of Double Blind, in this article about Ibogaine, um, one of the people that we interviewed talked to us about uh, this theory called the, the Great Disconnect. And essentially, it's a term that was coined by, um, by a psychologist named Alan Leshner. And the idea is that in our society that we basically pathologize addiction and that we don't take it seriously enough and that that is reflected in the treatments that we are and aren't willing to consider um, for addiction. So yes, the risks, there are risks to Ibogaine. Um, that being said, like the risk that you're gonna die from Ibogaine, especially if you're somewhere that's safe and that is doing an intake of your health history is not even remotely close to the risk that you're gonna overdose and die if you're addicted to opioids or heroin. That's so that point. really needs to be taken into account. I totally agree. Before we get off, before we finish up, let's talk a little bit about microdosing because this is such a hot topic that everybody talks about. You know, can you speak a little bit to, to microdosing psychedelics? Yeah, I sometimes say that microdosing psychedelics is like the CBD of psychedelics <laughs> in that it's sort of a way to like dip your toe in and not, not really get high. Um, not that there's anything wrong with getting high, and that's perhaps a whole other conversation. But, um, you know, whether you're microdosing to uh, lift your mood or deal with, you know, kind of like, ambient anxiety or depression, you know, a lot of people also think that it makes them more productive at work um, or more creative. Yeah, I've uh, heard that a lot. Creativity. Yeah, there are all different ways you can microdose, um, whether you're microdosing LSD or psilocybin, which I guess would be the most popular things to microdose. Um, and you can really just get on a regimen with it. So people will figure out a like what's a comfortable dose for them. Um, the idea is that it's sub perceptible, meaning that maybe you feel a little lifted, but you're not supposed to be like seeing patterns or feeling um, 
mentally high per se. Yeah, you're seeing um, patterns. You're not micro. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, even on a regular dose, you might not see patterns. But um, just just so people know, like, if they microdose, like, you took too much if, if you're seeing <laughs> <laughs> so but, the whole idea is to not really have too many effects. It's the same as with cannabis, to keep exactly. the, the side yeah. effects low and to get the most benefit out of it. Yeah, it really just kind of makes – it just gets – for me, it, like, gets rid of the static in my head a little bit. Oh, that's really cool. Be a little bit more straightforward in whatever I'm doing. So very be here now kind of um, experience. That's amazing. So for people who are interested in learning more about psychedelics, where do you, where do you guys send them besides your amazing magazine, which is, is it one of the, is it the first magazine about psychedelics? I think it is. I don't want to diminish, um, all the incredible outlets in the psychedelic media space, Reality Sandwich and Symposia and Shakruna. And there's a lot of people doing incredible stuff already. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think that we're the first physical print magazine that is, wi is widely distributed. I'll put it that way. Because we're, mm -hmm. we're in a number of bookstores. Fantastic. And yeah. it's, a, it's a beautiful, beautiful magazine. And when does the next issue come out? December. December. Yeah, December. One more time? December. December. Very cool. Awesome. Um, and how can people find you? Where can they find the magazine? Uh, Double Blind Mag is our handle on Instagram, Twitter. Um, find us on Facebook, Double Blind Mag. Um, and also on, on our website, doubleblindmag.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you guys so much. Thank you for the work you're doing. It's incredible and, and so, so needed. So I truly appreciate it. And thank you for talking to me today. Thanks, Thanks for having us on. Pleasure to have us. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Thank you.